Customary international law defines the state of armed conflict in such a way that two legally and factually relevant criteria have to be met to characterize a conflict as an armed conflict, either internal or international. That is, say, the intensity of the conflict, that there has to be protracted armed violence, and the level of organization of the participants in the conflict. In his final brief, the defense indicated relevant sources of law that established the undisputed authorities and precedents that embraced such a, a characterization according to the principles established, establishing the facts uh, from case to case. Final brief, paragraphs 12 to 37. The defense claims that the evidence that used undeniably established that the entire political and military leadership of the so-called RK had left Sector South, the theater of operations dealt with by the indictment, and the evidence indicated by the defense in final brief in paragraphs 38 through 41 leads to that conclusion. As the military and political leadership, as well as the bulk of the military units of the so-called ARSK had left. Intensive combat operations ceased, as did any kind of organization of the enemy armed forces. Immediately after the operations were halted, and I were referring to the police specifically, took over its obligations in the liberated territory. I do not know of any example in recent history, if we were to accept uh, the thesis that there is still an armed conflict, that civilian authority would take over its legally established authority in an area where there is still an armed conflict. However, it is correct that in the area of Sector South, in barely accessible mountainous regions, a small number of former members of the so-called ARSK had stayed behind, and that they carried out individual and sporadic armed attacks against police forces and the civilian population in the area. However, by no means can these activities be defined as intensive or organized. The repression apparatus of the Republic of Croatia carried out activities aimed at locating and neutralizing such groups during daily search of the terrain that followed after military operation storm. They were aimed at locating and neutralizing leftover weaponry mines and explosive devices with the basic objective of establishing civilian authority and general safety and security in the liberated area. Such sporadic and unorganized activities of the members of the former so-called ARSK cannot legally be characterized as an armed conflict. Customary international law characterizes such activity as internal disturbances and tensions. By its essence, form, and intention, this activity is actually a typical example of terrorist activity. It is the fundamental obligation of every sovereign state to use legal and repressive means against illegal activity that is directed at threatening the legal, state, and social system of the state concerned. On the basis of the law on the interior, that was in force at the time of these incidents. The basic function of the special police is combating terrorism. 
Therefore, the use of special police in actions of searching the terrain was not only the obligation of the sovereign state to establish an order in its territory in order to find and neutralize those who do not accept the legal system of the state. It was their legal obligation as such. There are different examples in contemporary history that were never characterized as that, as that kind of activity. I would like to remind you of the military and police actions of the Israeli army and police against the members of Hamas, actions of the British army and police against members of the IRA, actions of the Spanish police and army against the members of EDA, and so on. As a matter of fact, in these cases, they even had a rather good hierarchical organization, and in some cases, they even controlled parts of that territory. That is to say that there were some elements that could meet the criteria of customary international law that are applied for defining armed conflict. However, that never happened, and no international court ever established jurisdiction, and the jurisdiction of national courts was never brought into question. The evidence adduced, paragraph 38 of our final brief, show that already on the 7th of August 1995, at the 295th session of the Croatian government, Minister Šulšak announced the process of demobilization in the Croatian army. Thereby, already on 9th of August, that process started, and 70,000 members of the Croatian army were demobilized. This fact leads to the conclusion that the need for military operations to be carried out in the Croatian army had ceased to exist due to the absence of enemy combat activities of a higher degree of intensity and organization. The prosecutor recalls the decision made in the Tadic case in this tribunal, namely that a state of armed conflict ceases to exist once the peace agreement is concluded. The defense believes that this decision is not applicable in this specific case. First of all, because in accordance with international, customary international law, peace agreement is just one of the ways in which an armed conflict is brought to an end. Other ways are the factual cessation of hostilities, the establishment of friendly relations, unconditional surrender, or so-called subjugation, that is to say, subjugation. Additional Protocol 1 also envisages that the cessation of active hostilities or a general stop in military operations has to exist. The armed conflict in the Republic of Croatia in this specific case did not start with a formal declaration of any kind. We know that international law does not require a formal declaration of war in order for a war or armed conflict to start. However, in order to define state of armed conflict, why would we require a formal document establishing the end of that conflict. Just as the conflict started via facti, by an attack of the so-called army of the Republic of the Serb Kraina against government authorities of Croatia, that is to say police stations, the conflict ended in the same way, via facti. When the combat activity of the enemy side Sided, and when their structures fell apart. I would like to remind your honors of examples from recent history in which armed conflicts, or rather the process of hostilities, 
also ended without any kind of formal agreement. Giving the example of the Falklands armed conflict and the war between Iran and Iraq. So, Your Honors, it is the position of the defense that roughly after the 8th of August 1995, there was no armed conflict, and that is how it is defined by undisputed international law. This tribunal actually has no jurisdiction to prosecute crimes that were committed upon the conclusion of military operations during military operations storm, which the prosecutor charged as the commission of crimes from Articles 3 and 5 from the statute of this tribunal. Now I'd like to say a few words about joint criminal enterprise. That is about on the 29th of May, 2009, I spoke in this courtroom before this trial chamber at the beginning of the defense case. And I said that the defense would prove, contrary to the prosecutor's allegations, that there could be no question about the existence of a joint criminal enterprise which had allegedly involved my client, General Markash, among other persons. Today, 15 months later, I am absolutely convinced that the defense has managed to prove its case, i.e. that the prosecutor has failed to prove beyond reasonable doubt that a joint criminal enterprise ever existed and that my client was one of its participants, and that there are legal presumptions to apply the doctrine of the extended JCE Category 3. I said then that the style and form of the indictment in terms of its architecture reminded me of the indictment, indictments which had been widely applied in our domestic jurisdiction against perpetrators of alleged crimes against the socialist order of the former state pursuant to Article 26 of the former Penal Code of the Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia. Those crimes were allegedly motivated by a joint criminal plan to overthrow the socialist order of the former state. Crimes within that context that may have arisen from that plan were imputed to all the accused. All the states of the former socialist order recognized a similar system after the fall of the Berlin Wall and transition of political and legal systems. That system simply colla collapsed because it was rigid and unjust and it was not sustainable because it had existed on the margins of the achievements of modern civilization and the judicature of the modern civil society of the 20th century. However, despite the opinion of the Peel Chamber in the Tadic case about an, an astonishingly similarity between the Institute of Joint Criminal Enterprise and the provision of the former penal code of the Socialist the Republic of Yugoslavia, Article 26, dealing with the liability of an organizer of a criminal association or organization, one should clearly point out that this is simply not true. There are three crucial differences between the legal construct of JCE as proffered by the prosecutor and Article 26 of the former criminal code of the SFRY. Pursuant to Article 26, the only person who was held liable was the organizer of a criminal association who was also the criminal figure. When it comes to the extended JCE, it is not only the organizer or the leader of an enterprise who is held liable, but also potentially all persons by whom the plan has been adopted. 